Welcome to Catholic Homeschool Radio, where we begin conversations to help parents enrich their lives and make practical decisions for the future. Welcome, friends, and especially parents, to our homeschooling podcast, sponsored by Catholic Media Apostolate. Priscilla McCaffrey here, and um, here we have conversations in our own living room to generate new thinking about living as Catholics in a very secular world. We homeschoolers do have a great advantage. We have successfully turned away from secular myths of proper socialization and education in the younger years. And once you've experienced the liberation of setting up a sort of parallel institution to lower education, you begin to wonder about higher education. The secular world has lots of expectations for our children, so that's what we want to talk to you about today. One of the the biggest assumptions is that children must go to college to be successful, competitive, or educated. Is this truth or another secular myth? Our conversation today is with two of my good friends. They're moms who are writers and homeschooling parents. They're keen observers of cultural trends. I love to be around them. They always make me laugh. We have 15 children among us, and uh, we've had to think pretty carefully about this topic. They are Amy Kelly and Karen Anderson, both pretty much New Yorkers all their adult lives. Welcome, Amy. Happy to be here. Thanks for coming, Karen. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Yeah. We'll we'll try to cover some of this material in two parts. Part one will be a discussion of the problem with college. Part two will try to pull out some of the alternatives. Now, I confess in our household, we never had that conversation I'm we're starting today, which uh, about what our kids could do um, instead of college after age 18. And I think that was a mistake. I think we should have said this repeatedly, but we also have to show them a sort of program or agenda so they might understand what those non-college years would look like. And we did not provide that. That's why we are um, doing this program today so that we might say what we want in place for our kids who don't want the four-year path to college. Now, the three of us do pretty much um, have our children on a college path. And um, Amy, when I asked you to have this conversation with me, I could feel your resistance. (laughs) It it was palpable through the email. And and I get that you are putting your children on that path, and, and, and that seems to be what's the most natural thing for them, too. So... Um, I understand that. So can you tell us a little bit about your family and what the general family understanding is of what the kids will be doing after high school? Well, we have one son who has special needs, as you know, and uh, six children who don't have special needs. And for those six, we do encourage them to go to college and get a four-year degree. We don't encourage them to take on a lot of debt to do that. And since we can't help them and they have to put, put put themselves through school, they're probably all going to commute to first the community college and then one of the city colleges in New York because those are affordable. And um, so far we have one son who's currently doing that, another son who saved up a ton of money towards that, and a 14-year-old daughter who just got her first job. <laughs> so as yeah. far as the younger ones go, they, they know what the plan is because they see it in action. Mm-hmm. And Karen, um, well, first, Amy, what kind of degrees do you think your, your children will be after. Are you encouraging them, since it's the state universities, you're probably not encouraging them to go into the humanities? Well, I wouldn't discourage the humanities because I was an English major at a secular university. And I was really, I really benefited and was enriched by what I learned there. And I Mm -hmm. I wouldn't trade my education for anything. Mm -hmm. Although obviously such an education has its challenges and its problems. But so far, I think that my, my two sons, my older two sons who will go to college, they seem to be tending more toward the sciences oh, or right. something businessy. So okay. <laughs> they'll do something like that. Something businessy. <laughs> Karen, um, what is your general path, do you think, for your kids? Is there a plan for all of them? Or, I know they're all very literary. Well, our plan from the beginning has been somewhat of a make it up as you go along, although I should qualify that because it's not it's not it's not quite as laissez faire as that. Um, I have four daughters and my youngest child is a son. So for the girls, I've had, 
you know, I have done a lot of soul searching about, you know, this, this whole college thing, is it necessary? And um, one of the things that I decided early on was the most important thing that they needed to do as young women was to be kind of uh, functioning women who could maintain a household. That really was the primary thing. So I kind of, as part of the homeschooling thing that we did, I made sure that from very early they were able to sew, cook, clean, at least to some extent, probably better than I do. In fact, most likely better than I do. <laughs> That's great. And um, and sort of be adept in the survival arts is what I would call those. Um, and it really has, it has changed but things. Is it survival and not domestic? Well, both. <laughs> both. I mean, I, you know, it, repeatedly it'll happen. I know another friend of mine who has... Domestic boot camp. Yeah, domestic yeah. boot camp. She, another friend of ours has a... Um, a girl who went through college and she started re being referred to by her classmates as mom. And this is in a, you know, relatively small Catholic college. Uh -huh. And it was because she was the one who could cook and deal with, with all of the crises that the crises that came up. So, um, so that was the beginning of the picture. Then as they got older, I noticed, um, the, the oldest two, especially, and probably the third one now are extremely literary. They just read voraciously mm -hmm. everything. So, um, I was pretty open-minded when my older daughter went to look for a college and she was very willful. So she told me, I will not go to a Catholic college. <laughs> <laughs> so we started doing the tours of all the, the colleges that she had applied to that were within a four or five hour drive. And she got an eyeful and she really decided after one visit to the college that she is at, which is a small liberal arts Catholic, Catholic, uh, Catholic spirit college, um, that she really wanted to go there. And I'm very happy with the way it's turned out because, uh, because the education is a Western classical education. So she's not going, and my second daughter is not going there primarily for a vocational training. They're going there for a real serious Western in, you know, in the Western tradition education. Mm -hmm. So that's where we've ended up at this point. And that, that college was Thomas More College. Thomas More College in New Hampshire, yes. Which is a lovely place. I, I would encourage anyone to go up there and visit. We had a great time there uh, when they had Rabbi Ben's night, and we were treated to haggis. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and then these sensational renderings of um, poetry. The, the kids uh, from each class recited these poems, and it was what they had to have... Each one had a, um, they had to do a humorous poem and then a dramatic poem. And it was so entertaining. The audience was so with them. The kids just loved it. The parents, all the guests. It was a wonderful way to spend a night. And I, I'm very grateful for that. Uh, we took our, 18, uh, well, she was 16 at the time. We took our 16 year old up there and she loved it too. She thought it was wonderful. So we would encourage anyone to look into Thomas More for the uh, college in New Hampshire for the liberal arts. Um, okay, so uh, we are, you know, the three of us uh, are going to, we, we've, well, my, uh, my eldest went to Hillsdale. My middle child is at Thomas Aquinas College. He's finishing up. And our youngest is on her way to Wyoming Catholic College. And... Uh, Still, I, I think this is a valuable conversation, not just for people who have younger kids and are just beginning to think about college, but um, this is a kind of conversation that uh, is good for people who have their kids in college or have their kids in just a liberal arts program or in just kind of the sciences and uh, fine, you know business programs because there's I think there's a whole lot of supplemental, material out there that all our kids can tap into, uh, whether they have lots of degrees or no degrees. And so, so those are some of the things that we want to talk about maybe in the second part of the program. Um, okay. Before, uh, we begin the first part of the conversation, the, um, I have three points. Uh, first of all, uh, the notion that most American kids should go to college is really a relatively new concept. Uh, it's only been in the past 50 years that most kids in high school are told that they should be taking the SATs, the ACTs, they should get on that college path if they don't do well in, in high school physics. Uh, 
you know, they're not going to be able to get into college. So there's a lot of teaching and, and forming the kids with this one big objective, and that's to get them into a college. Um, but that really is, it's a relatively new concept. Uh, the second thing I want to point out is that the student debt, uh, it really has reached crisis proportions. Um, the total debt is a staggering $1.2 trillion, which exceeds the annual discretionary spending of the entire United States government, and that includes military spending. And it affects 40 million Americans. And even if we manage to get keep our kids out of debt, um, a lot of them will be falling in love with young people who have debt. And so this becomes a crisis for our young Catholic families who, and we, we, we're pretty much, um, we want to encourage them to fall in love and get married. And, uh, but then they have this crisis of debt and it could take years and years if they're not planning well. It's something they can handle, but they still have to be intelligent about approaching uh, this, this debt. And the third thing that we all consider and is uh, the atmosphere on most campuses, uh, inside and outside the classroom. And it, it seems to be hostile to Christian sensibilities. So those are the three things we, we need to keep in mind. And so with the first question, or the first point, the notion that most American kids should go to, co should go to college, I, I wonder if we looked at our parents' generation and um, I'm, I was born in the middle of the baby boom, Karen at the very end, Amy uh, sometime after that, but we all have parents who are born within five years of each other. So we kind of have an experience of the same older generation. And I would like to ask you, do you think that we who have more degrees in our generation, are we a better educated generation than our parents? And then... Are the millennials better better educated than we are? What do you all think about that? <laughs> That's a great question. I don't know the answer to that, but I do know that when my father went to Hunter College, he got a much better education than what I think Hunter College offers today. Mm. Uh, I guess I would have to admit that I don't think of college purely as a place to get an education. But because, as you say, so many people do have college degrees now, I think that it's hard for children when they don't because... Um, that's kind of like the playing field they're entering. Certainly is. Yeah. Um, but I think that, um, you know, now there are more women who go to college than men. So there, the, the, um, there are some interesting things going on in, in our culture where people are picking up, uh, well, maybe, you know, I, you know, um, so many people waste time in college. They see their buddies coming home a sophomore year, excuse me, a sophomore year, and they're wasted, and and <laughs> and it doesn't seem that they're very much further along in terms of education. Uh, yeah, so the atmosphere has certainly changed. Of the atmosphere of the campuses has changed. That's really clear. Uh, but you're you're saying also that the what your um, father got at Hunter was probably considerably better, but probably it was also because the, the students were better. You had your more competitive students. You had, you know, it wasn't watered down with kids who were pushed into college because that was the path. Right. Yeah. It was unusual, I think, back then to go to college even. Yeah, yeah I think so. It was. And I think too, that, you know, one of the reasons, of course, I think they did they did get out of college with a better education. And I wonder back in those days, did they have majors such as marketing or I met a young lady recently who was majoring in magazine journalism as opposed to any kind of as opposed to podcast journalism or something it just seemed to me to be such like a narrow little thing to major in how many Even, how many classes can you can you take in that and what happens to you when you get out you know so I think um yeah, so I'm sure that like the focus of study has changed so much for so many kids. Mm -hmm. There are even majors in things like video game design. So there is something, one of my kids actually brought this up to me yesterday. There are certain things that should not even be taken seriously right. that are actually being given 
a name as a as a major, and it's because and, and, and it gives someone a job to well, teach I don't think video gives, game design. Well, it's also it's a, that's like a trade school. It's not that it shouldn't mm -hmm. be taken seriously, but it should be taken seriously as if it's a trade. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I also wonder that to me, I mean, it seems to me what's behind it is getting this kid that is basically what we would call a loser to go to college and have his mother happy that he's going to college and he's got a degree that he's happy about. So it's all about placating people with, you know, who basically have developed no life skills, people who are just... Right. You know what's interesting about that? As, as you both know, my husband's a sculptor and he largely does toy prototyping. So he runs <laughs> 3D printers. So he runs, besides running 3D printers, he, he knows how to use all that software, that sculpting software. So he's constantly turning down requests to go to art schools and teach people how to oh, run wow. 3D printers and how to how to use the sculpting software. And he always refuses because guess what? There are no jobs. It's like a highly, it's oh, a high, the oh, field oh. is highly competitive. There are a small amount of sculptors that uh -huh. make a living. Uh -huh. And yet they seem to be training hundreds and hundreds of kids how to do this stuff. Well, that is the business of the schools. That's, I mean, yes. it is the business of the, of the universities is to stay so, in business to right. stay, as yes. teachers. You have some, does somebody want to fund some kind of a, a weird, you know, program? That's fine. You know, they'll do it. They'll go with it and they won't. So that's, that's, that's corrupt. Um, okay. All right. Well then back to the, the, um, uh, question of the the older generation being um, more educated. Uh, you a actually answered a little differently. The education they had was better if they did have the education. And, you know, I would say, okay, the ba baby boomers generation is, is more educated than that previous education, uh, previous generation. Uh, that's not to say... <laughs> We're, we're smarter or we were we were better off as a result. Uh, what did happen was a lot of the women um, started getting jobs because they were educated and they could work. So they did work and they got salaries. And, and around the late 60s with the women's movement, uh, women started being more valued for uh, being what for for uh, being breadwinners than for. Um, what they could do in a home. It's so that that's a big problem in in our society. But anyway, Karen, what do you, what would you say about uh, our our generation compared to the um, the great generation? Is that would you say your father is part of that? Uh, I don't, what are the parameters? Maybe he was a little he was young. He's for a little World young. War II. Yeah, yeah. I know he was too young for that. Yeah, too the, old for Korea. So he's. Yeah, the so that he something. was lucky. <laughs> the lucky generation. <laughs> I would have to say that well-educated is, you know, kind of an ambiguous term because did they have more education per se? Yes, yes, I think they do. Are they more wise? Are they more competent and capable human beings? I doubt it. I think in general, this generation is um, far less involved uh, politically in an effective way. Wait, like, what generation? Or the, the, the succeeding, the, the, the baby boomer generations. They were involved in like shaking fists and picketing, but very few of them really got involved in, you know, in doing political things for their town at a local level. Um, and I think, you know, I think people have become much more in, in uh, buying into an idea that you just pay somebody to do all that stuff for you. So while they're so well-educated... What, uh, what is that word? What... How were we? How did we become disenfranchised with uh, communal, commu the community spirit? Because I think there was this idea that you would go get and a so-called education, and then you would pay. You would be rich enough to pay everybody else to do all the dirty work. So the dirty work involves changing diapers. It involves voting. It involves um, getting involved, going to a community meeting about something. It involves knowing your neighbors. Um, mm. You know, having having tea on the front porch and getting to know all your neighbors and talking about political things. I think there's way less, you know, the political talk that I see people of this generation doing is all slogans. It's all oh, based on true. what, you know, now it's Twitter and Facebook, but then it was slogans and fist shaking and that kind of thing. So, you know, though they were well educated, I find that they, you know, you, you read many stories about farmers who never went to college in the 20s but could recite um, epic poetry, you know, the people who were in a sense much more deeply educated and who knew the Bible 
backwards and forwards. Mm -hmm. And I'd have to say that, you know, in an argument between, you know, a, a guy like that from the 20s and somebody from the 60s, I would have to say the 20s guys would probably run circles around them in many respects, just because of their their more deep rooted knowledge of human nature, which is not, you know, is not gained in four years of college. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe the fact that the farmer knew the ep epic poems by heart tells us that that's also the kind of education that you can accomplish on the elementary and high school level. Certainly, yes. I think that's really true. Yes. yes. Yeah. Right. Because certainly in days of old, when people got a classical education, it wasn't, it didn't start when they were 18. No, right. <laughs> actually, by the time they were and they I remember no junk reading, reading. I remember reading the, the requirements right. to get into Harvard. I think it was either Harvard or Yale. The requirements back in this, you know, 1700s were that you had to be able to read and write Latin. You had to be re read, write, speak Latin. You had to be able to read and write and speak, I think, Greek. And then you had to be able to read and write in Hebrew just to get into the college. Um, I, I, I know I might be a little bit, you know, I might have it a little off there, but I know it was those three languages were at, on some level were necessary just to get in. And you already had, you already would have had what now you're graduating even from a very good liberal arts school mm -hmm. with. That would have been your high school education. Okay. But that was for the elite. Again, these, yeah. this is for, we hate. It was a, a more select group. It was a more select group. And we hate to admit that in America, there are some people who should pursue that kind of an academic education. And the rest of the people, I would say probably the majority are not cut out for it. Not because they're stupid, but it's just not, you know, it's not their particular calling. They're just not that, you know, um, interested in it, or it, it's, it's like forcing an issue. And I don't think that the majority should be doing this. All right, and that sounds great. And you know, I, I would go along with that. But then we begin to shudder. But my kid needs and he needs a degree because if he applies for a job, no one's going to. Um, there, he'll just be dismissed if he doesn't have a yeah. degree. You know, the degree is a ticket. We and, and that's just sort of the given. Okay, so we we keep coming back to that, but we do want to. Okay, get ourselves into another frame of thinking. What's it going to look like if we don't have? in order for that degree not to be necessary. I think that the kid that doesn't need the degree is a kid who's very entrepreneurial and driven. Absolutely. Like when we talk about kids going into the trades, like sometimes um, sometimes we, we talk about electricians and plumbers as if they're all very affluent and they didn't go to college. And the fact is many tradespeople struggle to get by, but those who don't and end up running a fleet of trucks and so on and, and employing other people are just really entrepreneurial driven people. And so if I had a child like that, who wanted to do something similar, whether or not it was really a trade, whatever whatever that child wanted to do, and I, I, I'll, I'll say he, because I wouldn't encourage my daughter to do something like that, but uh, yes, then I would tell my child that that was a good thing that, that he could do, but he would have to really be driven and be willing to sell himself and be a business person and so on. Mm -hmm. They also have to start at an early age. Um, this type of child, I would say, usually has a pretty good idea starting young, what they like doing. Mm -hmm. And they have to actually start early on, you know, doing that thing. I know. I'm, I'm going to make one little point. There's a Mike Rowe. Have you heard of him? He has this, uh, um, he's kind of an evangelist for the, the American worker. He, he, he has a dirty jobs, um, website <laughs> like and he that. encourages, you know, the work in the trades and he, but he says something kind of interesting. He says, don't find something you love, find something you're good at. You're, yes. That's so true. Okay. Now, very often the thing you're good at is what you love. That's true. But, um, some things that you love are just not going to make you money. And it's, it's right. great that you have that talent, that art, that skill, maybe d develop that as an avocation, but maybe you're good at fixing cars and people are desperate for, you know, a good mechanic, a good, reliable and yeah. And, and so, um, well, in my own family, it's interesting because we, we did this experiment. My, my father saw what was going on in the colleges in the seventies um, and he, the late sixties. And he said, every single kid that we know that goes to college comes back and has lost their faith. So he flatly refused to allow us to go to college, four of us. And it's interesting. I'm the only one who did go to college, but, um, my three siblings, my younger brother, in his teens started working. He did, you know, he did little odd and end jobs at an art center nearby, but he got to be very friendly with one of the guys there who was a carpenter. And he just learned the carpenting trade very adeptly. He was very good with his hands and um, he never went to college. He started his own business doing custom made cabinetry. Mm -hmm. And he does well at it. You mm -hmm. know, he's not as rich as somebody on Wall Street, but he does do well at it. And he's darn good at it. Mm -hmm. And he gets a lot of referrals because- That's wonderful. 
And then my sister, um, my other brother never uh, went to college either. He got his, he was totally interested in electronics since he was about six years old and took apart a television on the dining room table. <laughs> and um, he ended up just getting his amateur uh, radio operator's license. He got the general test, which he passed at the age of 11 or 12. When now, was your father able to mentor him in this? He, your father was an extent, engineer. My father was an engineer to some extent, but with my brother, it just kind of sprung out of nowhere. He but was just. How, how do they know to get him his radio um, what, certification? Oh, uh, my brother was just amateur. relentless. He was he was just very driven, and he started. My mother would take us down to the library and take out every book on any subject we were interested. She would bring home a stack of books, <laughs> and we would read them. So. Um, so he ended up working for Sprint, and then whoever later brought out Sprint, I don't know, he works in their satellite tracking station, and he's done very well. He's worked, you know, in that field for his entire life, um, and he's the one they call when the satellites go down, and they have to That's repair fantastic. them from the ground. You know? and That's when, so and, interesting. And when they're saying, when they're calling them up, they're not saying, um, okay, we have the satellite down, what, what kind of degree do you have? No, no, no. They know he gets the work done, and he's on call every other weekend to, to you know, to just go and deal with it if, yeah. if a problem occurs. Yeah, so um, a lot of the, a lot, well, there are a lot of success stories of, you know, very famous people who did not go, who did not finish college. Um, Bill Gates, Rush Limbaugh. I love that Sigrid Unset didn't. Um, she had, at an early age, she had to support her, her mother and sisters. And so she went to um, a clerical school and worked in a bank, but she became, um, a Nobel Prize winner in literature, but she did all of her studying on her own, and and she hated the uh, progressive school her parents had put her into, and she's actually rather humorous about it. Um, so you have those big names, but I love to hear about these other stories of uh, the the young people who had a passion and then uh, you know locked in and uh, focused on that, and that that propensity seems. That's more of a male thing. I, I think that's one of the problems with men. And, <laughs> and one of their virtues is they focus and lock in, and then you can't you know, reach them on other levels. But um, the, you know, that's a great thing. But I also think that kind of a, of a child, or if you have a son like that, you, you'd also want to make sure that you introduce them to some other areas too. <laughs> yes. Or you kind of force them to read some of the books uh, that would, um, you know, some of the great books of Western Civ. It's it's interesting that you mentioned Sigrid Unset because um, writing and the arts, those are fields too where you really don't need a college degree. If you've, if you've always, if, if you're really it. driven <laughs> and you've always wanted to be an artist or you've always wanted to write, mm -hmm. you really don't need a degree to do those things because it's all about your work. I mean, mm -hmm. I do have a degree, but I'm confident that I could have gotten my initial reporting job without a degree. Really? Yes, because I responded to an ad that basically asked people to send in 10 article ideas. Oh, really? Yes. yes. And um, and after that, no one at the different jobs oh, at the different jobs I had within the company, nobody ever cared about my degree, and 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 getting an advanced degree never would have helped me. And it's the same for our friends who are graphic artists. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, degrees don't help with that. So I think for those kinds of kids too. But again, what I've said to my kids is, um, if you want to be a writer, you want to be a journalist, start doing it while you're high school age, college age. Because by the time you enter the job market in your early 20s, if you already have a body of work, mm -hmm. nothing else is really necessary. They know what to judge from. They're yeah. not going to say, what, what school did you go to? Right, right. Nothing's necessary. So in that sense, if you were really motivated at those things in high school, you could really start working mm -hmm. then. And then at age 18, it would be easy for you. And I think there are other fields too. I had a friend, young friend here last night who has a nursing degree. And she said, basically, it doesn't matter what, what where you got your nursing degree oh, because you're in demand. And I think the second part is they, they are mentoring you the whole time. When you're first on, everybody has a different protocol. So you have to learn their protocol all the time when you're when you go to a new place. Okay, we're going to stop for a few minutes and then uh, continue this conversation. Thanks. <laughs>